Good morning. Welcome to the chapel's live stream service. I'm Pastor Steve, and our worship team today is Ann, Rose, Pat, Jean, Laura, and Brenda. Can you believe it? It's June. I just noticed. I mean, it's June already. Of course, we still have the cicadas. And what I hear is they're not going to be gone until about July 1st. <laughs> and boy, are they noisy. But still a part of God's creation. If you were with us last week, we are trying to make improvements to our live stream service. And we hope that this week is better and more enjoyable for you to watch. Please bear with us during this transition. We are the chapel glorifying God in worship, service, love, and fellowship. Let us pray. Lord, we come this day having seen the miracles of everyday creation in your world. We have enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the gentle rain. We have marveled over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of your creation. Make our hearts ready to receive your word for us, that we may go forth ready to joyfully serve you all our days. Amen. Please join our singers today and come sinners to the gospel feast. join me in the call to worship. Let us lift up the name of our God. Let us praise, praise the faithfulness of the Lord. For just as the Lord's greatness fills the heavens, the Lord's love embraces the earth, preserving our life in the midst of trouble. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We will now hear the anthem, God So Loved the World, um, sung by Rose, Pat, and Anne, accompanied by Laura. <laughs>
Let's pray. Holy One, open our hearts to your loving spirit. Incline our ears to the truth of your scriptures. Renew our lives in thanksgiving and prayers. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from Mark, third chapter, verses 20 to 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, and they said he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. And he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a wonderful time honored story about a country preacher who announced on the following Sunday he would be preaching on the story of Noah and the ark. And he gave the scriptural reference so that the congregation could read over the week. Be ready for the sermon. However, as with most churches, there was a couple of mischievous boys in the church. And they noticed something interesting about the church Bible. So they slipped into the church and glued two of the pages of the large Bible together. So on the following Sunday, the preacher got up to read his text. He was reading, of course, from the King James Version. And he said, Noah took himself a wife as he began, and she was, and he took a moment to turn the page. She was 30 cubits long, 50 cubits <laughs> wide, and 30 cubits high. And he paused at that point, turned and flipped the page back, read it silently, read it again. She was 30 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. He still didn't realize that the two pages had been glued together. Finally, he looked up at his congregation and said, I've been reading this old Bible for nigh on to 50 years, but there are still some things 
that I have a hard time understanding in the Bible. Well, I'm going to confess, I have the same issue. There are times when you read the Bible and you end up scratching your head. And the scripture we heard and read this morning is one of them. The narrative in Mark 3 concerning Jesus' uncertain relationship with his family. Now again, listen, this is Mark writing this about Jesus. When his firm family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. That's Jesus we're talking about. This is his mother and brothers who are saying these things. Now let's think for a minute. If you are a writer of the gospel trying to convince people that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, then why in the world would you include that in your scripture? You're saying that at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, his own family had questions about his sanity. Now Matthew and Mark incorporate such of the same material as Matthew's, and these stories are included the last part, not the first. They don't include the riff why his mother and brothers went to visit him. Now the Gospel writer John does say at one point, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. When you hear that, you say, well that sounds a whole lot better than saying Jesus is crazy. Why would Mark include this story? Maybe because it really happened. There are many people who are so critical of us and the Bible who think everything's made up. If so, then the writers really did a poor job of putting their scriptures together. If there was some sort of conspiracy about the early part and by the early Christian historians, don't you think they would have tried to reconcile these stories, make it slow and be easy? Even an event as critical as what we believe as Jesus' resurrection is told from several point of views. I mean, don't you think if we were trying to fabricate the story that the cornerstone of our faith, it's unique, among us Christians, they would have ironed out all the wrinkles and would have flowed seamlessly so that no one would question its authenticity. Instead, the story is preserved in a jumble of eyewitness testimonies that only agree on the most important fact, that Christ certainly was resurrected from the grave, but give different accounts on how that truth was discovered. I don't need to tell you this, but we live in a time of fake news and spin, perpetrated by slick commentators who make sure that they get their story straight in agreement with all those others who happen to believe the same theories. You know, it's kind of funny watching reporters trying to get at the truth with politicians who answer the party line, whatever the question is. It would be humorous if it wasn't so sad. The writers of the Old and New Testament were simple people who simply reported what they had seen and what they had heard. They weren't trying to get the facts to cover their biases. They were reporting the facts as they truly perceived them. Sure, eyewitnesses' accounts differ. That's one of the things you can count on. If several people are describing the same scene, exactly the same words, they're reading from a script. In other words, they're lying. It's fake news. When I was a police officer, I worked many, many accidents and interviewed many people. And when you interviewed them, each person had their own perspective. 
It's when you put them together that you could glean the truth of what really happened. I think the first reason Mark tells us about Jesus' problem with his family is because it did happen. After all, Jesus' teachings were not orthodox. If he simply taught what every other rabbi taught, then why would he need to come to earth? Even those who thought his teachings, those who thought his teachings, even though they loved him, thought it was extreme. We need to remember Jesus never got all story-eyed when he talked about family. Remember how he said to one man, follow me, and the man replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go proclaim the kingdom of God. Kind of harsh, don't you think? Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me go say goodbye to my family first. And Jesus replied, no one who puts the hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Later in the same chapter, Jesus' mothers and brothers came looking for her. And Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my brothers, mother. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Can you imagine how Jesus' family might have taken of that? Would they have taken it personally? How would you feel if you were in their place? All families have issues. There are no perfect families. And I believe that Mark mentioned the problems Jesus had with his family to emphasize there is no perfect family. The Bible is very open and direct about the difficulties of family life. Think of the stories in the Bible. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. Think of the troubled marriages, Abraham and Sarah, Hosea and Gomer, David and his many wives. It's very difficult to find an example of an ideal family in the Bible. However, all things change with the coming of Jesus. That's one reason Christians have made such an impact on the society at that time. In spite of some of Jesus' rather radical teachings, the early Christian community took marriage and family very seriously. Obviously, that was because of their association with Jesus. They knew that Christ was not anti-family. He was simply pro-kingdom of God first. He knew that if you sought God's kingdom, everything else, including your family life, would fall in place. When Brenda and I started dating, we made one agreement. As much as I love her, she's not the number one love in my life. God is. I'm not the number one in her life. God is. We love God, each other, and family. Because if you believe in God first and follow him, everything else falls in place. Another reason that Mark may have mentioned the conflict between Jesus and his family was to set the stage for what was to happen to his family after crucifixion and resurrection. According to the Bible, Jesus had four brothers, James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. He also has sisters, but we do not know their names or how many. We do not know what the real source of unhappiness in the family. Why were they concerned about Jesus' sanity? But something there, let me rephrase that. But you know, when you're part of family, you don't always see family as others outside change because they couldn't see his true worth and value. 
I mean, when Jesus started his ministry in Nazareth, people remembered him as Joseph's son. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And maybe so in your own family. I wonder if Mary and Joseph ever told Jesus' siblings the stories of Christmas, of the angels' visitation, of the wise men, or the angels from heaven singing. Perhaps they decided it would only cause confusion in the minds of the children, maybe even resentment, as a story of Joseph in his amazing technicolor dream coat. In any case, his siblings did not immediately embrace the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the one whom Israel had been waiting for hundreds of years. I mention this because there's a psychiatrist at Emory University who made an interesting discovery. He says it's important for us to tell our children the stories of our family. He and another psychologist at Emory asked children to answer 20 questions about their family. Questions such as, do you know where your grandparents grew up? Do you know where your mom and dad went to high school? Do you know about an illness or something really terrible that happened in your family? Then they compared the children's results with a battery of psychological tests, tests that the children had taken, and they reached an overwhelming conclusion. The more children knew about their own family history, the stronger their sense of control over their own lives, the higher their self-esteem and the more successfully they believe their family functioned. Maybe Mary and Joseph made a decision not to tell Jesus' siblings about the wondrous events at his birth. Or maybe they did tell them, and they reacted like Joseph's brothers did in the Old Testament, where they sold their own brother as a slave. Whatever the background of the story and his family's resentment over Jesus, it makes it more thrilling than we read in Acts. In Acts 1, we hear these words. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from a hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Something obviously had happened in the family, a family that had been torn with conflict, that they thought about taking Jesus home at the beginning of his ministry, something that made them change their minds about his teaching. In fact, later we find that these same brothers became quite important in the history of the early church. According to tradition, Jesus' brother James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem and the author of the book James. He sometimes referred to James the Righteous to distinguish him from James the Apostle. His brother Jude is also credited with writing one of the books in the Bible. We find Jude in the New Testament. What a wonderful turn of events. The same family members who thought he was out of his mind become part of the family of faith. Why? Because it all really did happen. 
Jesus' amazing but unorthodox ministry, the strife with his family, his crucifixion by religious authority, and most important, his resurrection from the grave. It all really happened. The early Christian writers didn't try to get their stories straight. This is not fake news. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is risen from the grave. If you doubt that's true, ask his mother. Ask any members of his family. And you see, because it is true, we are all saved. Amen. Please join in the singing of In Unity We Lift Our Song.
our hearts and minds and get in the mood for prayer. Our little mini choir here will sing Sanctuary. Let us pray. Oh God, hear our prayer. We need to know that beyond us, you are. For while we seek our own salvation, it cannot be had through striving. We think highly of ourselves, O oh Lord, but we are not great, only driven by dreams of greatness. And we have stumbled upon such dreams until finally we have fallen and plunged into the pit. And yet, O oh God, we are not alone. For suddenly we perceive that you are with us. You are the one that can carry us up and out of the pit and into the light. Lord, in this season of growth, open our hearts to grow in your love. Help us to truly trust in your creative process in our lives. We look around and see the beauty of your world, the blossoming flowers and plants, the growth of children, the joys of celebrations of graduation and marriage, of receiving new life. We also see the sadness and sorrow that has invaded the world when systems of injustice and hatred lay claim to people's lives. Prepare us, O oh Lord, to become ambassadors of the peace and hope. Help us to place our trust in you, so that when we are serving others, they may come to know your abiding love and power. Give us courage and great joy as we serve you. Amen. It is through your generosity that we can continue to operate as a church. There are many ways that you can sustain the word of God to all of God's children. Facebook, text, website, or even the U.S. mail. Please help us to sustain our ministry. Let us pray. Almighty Creator, you have blessed us with abundant life and steadfast love. We offer these gifts to you, asking that your Holy Spirit will bless them and use them to shower grace and love upon our brothers and sisters, both near and far. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
Let us now rejoice and focus on God's presence, love, and forgiveness in the sacrament of Holy Communion. There's a guide on how to plan and prepare online communion that can be found in the online bulletin. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and set out your elements for, for communion. And if not participating in communion right now, that's okay. You may be watching at another time. So just this, use this time as a time of prayer and reflection. Online communion is an extension of the Lord's table. Focus on the wonder and mystery of the presence of God wherever you may be. And think of the space where you are as an extension of the Lord's table. Wherever you are, God is with you. And we are together in spirit. This table of our Lord is an open table. It's open for all who seek a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, regardless of denomination or affiliation. This is the food of our souls for all God's children. Hear now this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away, our love failed, but your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God. You spoke to us through your prophets, who look for that day when justice shall roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, might. Heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the, the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. 
by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at the right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, almighty God, and then gave it to his disciples, said, Drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, died, Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will, will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and those of you who are worshiping online and on our gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by that blood. By your spirits, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one in Christ. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I ask you now at this time to start taking your communion among yourselves. For those of us who are here, find your wafer. The body of Christ given for you. your little cup. The blood of Christ shed for you.
eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on page 2158, and that's in the Black Faith We Sing book, Just a Closer Walk With Thee. live stream successful. We have someone in here today trying to help us and we're trying to make it better. There's still some issues. I know, but we're working on this. And part of the reason we're working on this is when we get the lands down, then we still, besides the in-person, we still want to be able to reach those of you who can't leave or don't want to leave your residence yet. So just bear with us. We are working every week 
we are going to fix some problem and we're going to create some new. But we will get this done. Um, and now for our benediction. Live in peace. Know that the miracles of God are produced in your life. And be aware there are miracles yet to come. Bear witness to God's love for all of his ease. And go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.